Okay, Tom. I think it's pretty well. Everybody agrees that betting and horse racing. You know, there's very very few people that are interested in one and not the other. Are you a punter? Yep, yeah, I do punt. Um, and before you ask, uh, no, not particularly great at it. I'd say over the course of the year, I like to think I make a small profit, which probably means I make a small loss. Um, I used to be a much bigger punter. Uh, I told you before about how Quarto Star got me into got me into the sport, and um, when he was in his pomp, I was just I just every spare quid I had, I would just pile on Quarto Star, and I built up these huge anti post positions. And the biggest one I ever built up was um, was two thousand pounds for the Gold Cup. And it was the first time I actually went to Cheltenham as well. And I went down, um, and of course it was 2008 when he got thumped by Dem, and, and I lost two grand, which uh, was every penny I had in the world, and about every penny I'd had for the six months running up to that. So it was, uh, it was, it was pot noodle. It wasn't even pot noodle actually. It was you know sort of Tesco own brand instant noodles uh, for the next few months. Um, and since then, uh, my, my my betting is a more modest. An affordable uh, level, but uh, I certainly am a pun. Now, I understand that you've got a few opinions about bookmakers and bookmakers' behaviour in general, and you can really let us have it because we don't mind you giving bookmakers a hard time on, in these interviews. Sure. Well, I think uh, bookmakers are increasingly sort of beginning to recognise that perhaps they haven't behaved in the uh, in the best way. I think there's been a lot of short-termism where bookmakers have been attempting to. Uh, make as much money as possible with the introduction of things like fob tees and uh, really sort of trying to capture a mainstream market and I think perhaps they've, they've lost sight of what they what they traditionally did which is take bets on sports um, I don't think they're the total pariahs they're sometimes made out to be but at the same time I think that there's a the sort of last decade or so is has shown there's there's a fair bit to be desired in the way some are, some bookmakers have conducted themselves, and I think now you're seeing that awareness uh, sort of percolating through at the upper echelons of big bookmakers. You know, you're seeing the launch of campaigns around uh, problem gambling and social responsibility, and and also in terms of uh, sort of terms and conditions online. They were censured last year for sort of some of the online bonuses that they've been offering offering out, which then sort of trap. Uh, customers money for a long time and of course there's the the ongoing debate about um, taking bets and restricting accounts uh, which is which is you know been a major sort of reputational blow for bookmakers okay so we accept that some punters successful punters even if they're not massively successful have a job to get on so would you think that the sort of bookmaker punter cat and mouse of 2018 where they might get their auntie to put the bet on or you know, you know, a friend or whatever. Is that legitimate fair game? And once those bets are on, did they stand? I think if you look at it from a purely legal standpoint, you can say, well, if you uh, contravene the terms and conditions, then a, a company is entitled to say, we're not going to pay out. But I think what people find unfair, and legitimately so, is that bookmakers, if the bet loses, they're not going to say, "Oh, you, 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 you did. You got around our terms and conditions. Here's your money back. We shouldn't have accepted that bet." They're basically only saying, "You know, we won't pay out if you win." That, or at least that's how it's perceived. And I think if that's the case, then certainly you can understand why people have an issue with with that situation. Okay, thank you. Now, issues the the wider racing game. What do you feel the biggest issue? That faces racing at the moment is. I think it's um, basically where the next generation is coming from, and sort of racecourse crowds. And I've written about this a few times. And I think if you look at racecourse crowds, you know the, the industry is always trumpeting the six million people going racing, which is fantastic. You know, it's the second biggest spectator sport in Britain. Um, a huge, huge sort of interest in it across sort of society. Which is fantastic, and you're seeing a lot of young people on race courses as well. What I think is concerning is the number of people who are going racing without racing or betting being high on their list of priorities. Um, there was a bit of research done by the Racecourse Association a couple of years back, which I think showed 
you know, two thirds of race goers who were mainly going for the social uh, side of racing. And it's great, you know, I mean, going racing is a fantastic day out. I've taken loads of friends there and I don't think anyone's ever had a bad day. You, you have a few drinks, you have a few bets, uh, maybe there's a band on. It's great fun, you know, there's a lot of drama, a lot of color, a lot of excitement. What I think is concerning is whether racing is turning those social race goers into fans of the sport or people who want to bet on it regularly. Because unless it is, we're not going to have a sustainable sport because the sport is funded by betting. It's not and never can be funded by race course attendance alone. It's simply not something that's going to add up unless they hike ticket prices up by two or three times what they currently are and expect to see just as many people coming through the through the door. So racing's big issue is how do we turn people who enjoy racing as a day out into people who watch on TV, have a bet, follow the uh, the stars of the sport and follow the horses and read the form and place bets. That's a big question. Okay, so what would your idea the answer be? If I knew that if I knew that, I would. Uh, I probably wouldn't be working for the Racing Post. I'd probably be snapped up by the BHA or Great British Racing to spearhead their their strategy because it is the sort of two hundred million pound question, which has exercised people in racing for 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 as long as I've known the sport. Um, I think part of it has to be about making it um, just making it interesting. There's got to be any successful sp sport makes people argue about things, it makes them argue about personalities and horses. You know, racing's got this advantage that it is a game which is literally based on opinions. Um, and yet, as we've discussed already, I think sometimes when people have the, uh, you know, sort of upset the apple cart in racing, people respond very negatively. I think that's a shame because I think controversy I think interesting stories are part of what makes a sport interesting and you know if, if racing wants loads of people to, to be interested in it um, you know we've got to encourage people to have strong opinions and to argue about them and get on social media and, and discuss things and you know make their own opinions. We've mentioned upturning apple carts, it's nearly upturned trees behind you. <laughs> um, but that, that leads me well on to the last question. Now you're a young man already a skilled journalist with a great future one would anticipate but will you better fulfill your potential in a sport that takes such immediate offense to having his feathers ruffled and the apple cart upturned and is it likely you might you might sort of turn to something a little more mainstream as your career matures well i mean I, i'd just say for everyone has complaints about you know how people respond to uh, you know what they write every journalist might have their own issues but Racing has been fantastic. I mean, I have had the most amazing time uh, working here and it's taken me around the world into amazing race courses. I go to Cheltenham Festival every year. I've met amazing people um, in the sport who follow the sport um, and I've told some fantastic stories. And ultimately, as a journalist, what I want to do is to tell interesting stories. And racing has uh, an unbelievable reserve of, of these stories. It's a, it's a sport which is absolutely awash with history, with tradition, with nuance and for any sports writer, for any writer to report on something like that is, is, is pretty much a, a dream and, and I think that's why you've seen so many fantastic writers through the years covering racing. It's got such a rich history in terms of journalism as well as everything else and um, you know I've, I've barely scratched the surface to be honest. Um, do you feel print media, is there still a future for print media? Well, that might be the bigger problem. <laughs> I hope so. I definitely hope so. I mean, I love reading a newspaper, um, but I think realistically we're going to see digital becoming more and more important as the years roll by. And obviously that brings with it new challenges, not least about how do you make journalism pay. Um, and that's something the entire media is grappling with. But you know, as a journalist, my interest in that is, is, is making it work and making it work in a way which preserves the values of journalism, which I care about, which is that you uh, you tell stories truthfully. You you give the voice to people who wouldn't otherwise have a voice. You challenge authority when it's when it's in the wrong. And um, you know I, I've I've got great hopes that we'll be able to do that long into the future. Brilliant, Tom Kerr. Thank you very much. Thanks.